Hello and welcome to this very special edition of In Conversations. We are live at Engfest and I am here with Brian David Johnson. Brian, you've just given your presentation. How did it go? It was phenomenal, and it was phenomenal not because of me, but because of all the young people in the audience. It's one of the things I, I love doing is getting up in front of young minds and actually telling them that they're the ones who are going to build the future, showing them where I think things are going, and then actually empowering them to actually go out and build it. So you're both um, a futurist and an author. Mm -hmm. Now we'll, we'll, we'll come to the, the author side in a moment, but what exactly is a futurist? So as a futurist, I look 10 years out and I work with organizations to look 10 years out to model both positive and negative futures. And then I work with them to turn around and look backwards and say, okay, what do we need to do today, tomorrow, five years from now to move towards that positive future and away from the negative? So basically, I'm an applied futurist. I not only envision the future, but then I work with people to actually build it. Okay, so, so how did you get started? So I'm an engineer, I was raised by engineers, and so I was brought in to go and build technologies that took about four or five years to be built. At the time, 25 years ago, you really couldn't become, you couldn't go to school or go to university to become a futurist. And so I was an engineer who had the ability to look at not only hardware and software, but also economics, social changes, trends like that, and then be able to pull that together. So it was really through necessity. So can anyone become a futurist? I argue that everybody should become a futurist, that this way of thinking like a futurist or a futurologist is really helpful to people because you've got to have a vision for the future because nothing great was ever built by human beings that wasn't imagined first. So you could be in banking, you could be a homemaker, you could be a doctor. The future is important to all of us. Okay, so in that sense, I suppose it's an invitation to have people come up with ideas. I suppose that's, that's where we are. So you must hear some crazy far out ideas. I love the crazy ideas. That's what I always encourage people. That's what I did today at the fest is I said to people, yes, we need to have innovative ideas. Yes, we need to have brilliant ideas, but we also need crazy ideas. We need dumb ideas because the idea is that you should encourage everybody, your friends and your family your, to use their imagination because imagination is the number one most underutilized tool in engineering to say, come up with crazy ideas because crazy ideas are only crazy until we figure out their genius. And that's how you come up with the genius ideas. Nice. Well, talking about crazy ideas, actually, in your, in your speech a moment ago, you mentioned that before being a futurist, that you're actually a, a zombie hunter for the US government. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about that. So that was my first job as I got out of school. Um, it was very early days, where back in the early days of the personal computer, right, where we were used to have those big mainframes where you had in computers that were the size of rooms, and now we had these little PCs. And so we were turning them into a network. It was very early days of networking. And so basically what a zombie is, it's an application that is running on a local machine and running on a network. And if you shut off the local machine, you essentially cut off its head, and then you have these zombie programs running around the network. And so if you've got 500 users doing it five times a week, a lot of zombies clog up the network. So it was my job to actually go out and physically you had to go find them and actually kill those zombies. So at that point in your career, did you know you were going to become a futurist? Or had you not seen that yet? I had not seen that yet. I, it was only when I was going to uh, my next step, actually going and starting to building engineering, that when I looked back at being a zombie hunter and looked back at my work when I was working in college, all of it was the work of being a futurist. It is something that I was kind of born to do. So in terms of the future then, have you any ideas on what we're looking at towards kind of 2030? Do you, do you have a vision of what the future will be? Yeah, what I do is I look 10 years out. And so I have to ask myself, not what's the next big thing, but what's the thing after the thing, right? And so I'm looking at what comes after artificial intelligence, what comes after autonomy and land, sea, and air, what comes after the Internet of Things, what comes after smart cities, all these things. And for me, it's this notion of sentient tools. So these are tools that are aware. They can think. Now, they're not smarter than humans, right? Because there's wide swath of AI and machine learning that just does work, and that's what I'm talking about. So they'll be aware. They'll be physically and socially aware. They'll be able to think, but they'll also know us as individuals. They'll know you as a human. It'll know you, your family. It'll know if you're an introvert or an extrovert. It'll know if you're in a good mood or a bad mood. So imagine having personal computing that is truly personal but then these tools that are really powerful. And so I argue that we're not prepared yet, that we, our education system, our economies are not prepared for these sentient tools because they're gonna radically transform everything we do. 
I've, I've had lots of conversations in the past about uh, autonomous vehicles and as much ethics. Um, I've also attended speech, uh, presentations about um, ethics in cyborgs. Mm -hmm. Now, again, with this fear in the public eye of robots taking people's jobs, is this kind of future one that people should be scared of? I mean, Hollywood paints a pretty scary picture. Well, <clears throat> so being a science fiction author, yeah. right, scary pictures make good stories. So, and I'm all for good stories, I'm all for scary stories, and, but it doesn't make good futures. And so ultimately we can talk about these scary stories, we can talk about these dystopias, but then we need to have a conversation to say, well, what do we do about it? So, okay, yes, these things might happen. Okay, great, now we've said that. What are the steps we need to take? And so when it comes to these ethics, when it comes to ethics around these, what I tell people, it's not about building ethical autonomous vehicles. It's not about building ethical artificial intelligence. It's about making them ethically compliant. Now, this is a very, very important um, specification, right? It's saying, how are we making autonomous technologies that are ethically compliant to what we believe, to our culture, our laws, what we want, the future we want, and the future we want to avoid? And that's actually, I think, the conversations we should be having. It's not about how do we make them ethical, is what do we want? How do we keep humans at the center of the design of all these technologies and then make sure we're imbuing them with those values? That's a fantastic point. Very much about the future that we want and very much about the future that we don't want. So please feel free to leave any comments below for the future that you want because I know we're all very different people. You mentioned stories. Now, that takes us on to Wizards and Robots. Yes. Tell me a bit about this. I noticed that this, is, uh, this has got both Brian's name on and Will I Am at the top. So how did, how did that collaboration come about? So I met Will at work. So we were both working at the Intel Corporation where I was their chief futurist and he was the in chief innovation officer. We just hit it off. Um, we started talking about robots and technology and we just became friends. And then Will called me with this crazy idea about wizards and robots and this epic battle. And I said, yeah, let's do it. Let's write it. Let's write a book. And so we started writing the book together. And it was really actually quite easy. I mean, if you can imagine somebody like Will I Am, it's pretty amazing to collaborate with him. And we would go back and forth and we would fight and sort of as collaborators would. And we wanted to make sure as we were crafting the story, we made it a young adult novel. By making a young, a young adult novel, we wanted to inspire the next generation, to give them a vision for the future that's fun and exciting and wizards and robots and fighting and all this stuff, but actually to give them a vision of robots that was radically different than anything they had seen. To give them a vision of themselves as the superheroes, so that you have young female engineers who are actually saving the world. We wanted to make sure that we told those stories and empowered those young minds to do that. It's a very important subject that we touch on a lot, uh, women in engineering, yep. and, and I think that's fantastic. So this is available now, for you to go and buy. Um, in all good bookstores and online. Brian, thank you ever so much. I hope you have a fantastic day and, and have a chance to take a look at the, the, the wonderful exhibits and interact with the, the fantastic future of engineering. Thank you so much.